I heard this story on the news. There's this guy up in Washington State on death row, and they want to hang him, but they can't. Anybody know why? Because he's too fat to hang. <laughs> too fat to hang. He's like 450 pounds. They say if they hang him, it'll decapitate him. Right, which is apparently some big fucking problem. <laughs> I'm in Washington. And I guess they don't want to kill him too much, you know, so. <laughs> Everybody up there is running around going, how can we kill him humanely? You know we got to kill him humanely. <laughs> I'm like, dude, he's 450 pounds. How hard could it be? They can walk up a flight of fucking stairs. Don't call 911. Seriously, if that doesn't work, two flights. If that doesn't work, three flights, and so on. Eventually, he'll have the heart attack. Or he'll lose the weight, and we can hang his ass. That's yeah, a little plan I like to call the Stairmaster of Justice. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are and whoever you are. This is Ben McLeish of the Zeitgeist Movement UK, bringing this week's show. Uh, this is normally a weekly show, but I must already flag up that next week uh, will be a show that we skip, so there'll be a fallow week, so to speak. Um, today's show is a direct, not a rebuttal to, but an answer, if you like, to last week's show with Thomas Anderson and... Matt Berkowitz of uh, the Zeitgeist Movement, respectively Austria and Canada, who were speaking about veganism and vegetarianism and how this factors into the worldview that might be described as that of a natural law resource-based economy. The understanding of a systems-based world, systems-based human bodies, and how we might maximize these for their innate potentials to improve the lot of all of humanity and the ecosystem. Um, this week's show is a recorded interview with uh, Vivak Shori, who's another member of our movement from Cardiff, uh, from the, the, the Cardiff chapter of the Zeitgeist Movement in the UK. Very active, uh, very, a very active chapter since the beginning. Um, Vivak is a molecular biologist by trade, <clears throat> or at least by training, I should say. And he brings to the table some very interesting um, hypotheses and some research that will be linked in the show's notes um, either at the beginning or once I've posted it, um, which sort of counteracts or rebuts, if you like, the idea of a plant-based or, or a, if you like, a vegan or a vegetarian diet. The responses to this should be interesting. I'm sure he has um, many uh, people who agree with him as, as well as many who do not. One thing I have noticed in the short time that I have run these shows is that they have a phenomenal amount of feedback attached to them. Normally we hear very little other than uh, that the people are pleased or that they thought it was interesting. Now I'm getting large emails with details and links and descriptions, and people are really taking their time to to feed back and, and provide their views and all the rest of it. So for that, I must thank everybody who's done that so far. I am going to take a moment or two in a future show to read out some of the correspondence I've received um, in the hope that that may also fill in the, the blanks um, of... Uh, my understanding, at least, of nutrition and perhaps the understanding of nutrition of some of our listeners. However, I seem to, uh, if I'm if I'm to judge the amount of communications I'm receiving, it seems to be that almost everybody knows more about nutrition than I. So this is, of course, not a bad thing. I think it might make me a fairly decent interview when it comes to not having too many biases. Um, but we'll see. Maybe uh, I will falter and bring someone else in for a future show. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, without any further ado, um, here is my interview with Vivak Shori of Zeitgeist Cardiff on the expensive tissue hypothesis, um, Alan Savory's theory of ruminants and soil erosion, and many other talking points which we got to in the hour and a half that we spent together. This week we have Vivak Shori from the Cardiff chapter of the Zeitgeist Movement. For anybody who has taken more than 12 seconds of time to review our movement, they will know the Cardiff chapter has been from the beginning and is still now a very, very active, very vocal chapter and a very soft start chapter. So it's an honor to have one of their number on the show, uh, finally. Vivac, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, glad to be on. Now, we are at the moment running a, a small mini 
series uh, on nutrition. It's something that's been bugging me since at least January of this year on a personal level, where I actually decided to look at what I was shoving in my body without a second thought for the calories or the ingredients. And I have reached out to the community for um, people who have radically altered their intakes or have a particular knowledge of a certain area of this. And you were recommended to me by two or three different people. And I had known your name for a while, actually, as somebody who deals with nutrition. So would you like to give me a little bit of background, give the, the listeners some background on who you are, what you do, and what your specialization areas might be? Yeah, well, I suppose if I have a domain of expertise, I suppose it's in biochemistry, molecular biology. However, it's not a field I've really worked in as such. Um, I did a brief placement during my degree, and this was back in the 90s, I'm 38, so uh, it, as a field of science has moved on you know, quite significantly. Um, however, uh, I used to be, uh, in my 20s, coming up to the 30s, uh, you know, considerably overweight. I was about two stone, so uh, 14 pounds in stone. So quite a lot for a guy who's five foot six. So uh, um, I think I've said before to people that, you know, I kind of looked 10 months pregnant. Um, I was qu- um, and I had also a, a whole series of health issues. Uh, my asthma was particularly bad. And also, I suppose, looking back, I was clinically depressed uh, um, at, at one stage. Even though things in my life were actually going quite well, I used to have unexplained bouts of irrational anger and things like that. And so I did what most people try to do initially, is try to lose weight by doing lots of exercise and eating low fat and eating healthy whole grains and um, whatnot. The usual standard advice, you know, that you, you hear. And... Um, uh, I could only ever lose about half stone, despite, you know, exercising two hours a day for six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And then I thought, oh, Jesus, you know, I'm not going anywhere with this. So maybe I should, uh, you know, go back to the biochemistry. And to cut a long story short, I just basically did Atkins for two months, about two and a half months. And um, I lost two stone, two and a half stone in two months with no exercise. So when something that deep and profound happens to you, you know, when you physically see yourself just, you know, fat melting off you, um, you really start to question other things. I I should uh, hasten to add that I come from a family of basically, a lot of my extended family, my father's community pharmacist in the South Wales Valleys. Um, So I kind of was brought up in a, you know, exposed to a lot of medical uh, stuff. I have a a cousin who's a cardiologist, things like that. So... And then I realized that a lot of these guys are basically, the advice is incorrect on a lot of levels. And I suppose we can go into that in the detail, if you wish. Sure, absolutely. There are a couple of points I want to bring up straight away because you accidentally touched on them. The, the existence of behavioral modification with regards to diet is very interesting. Yeah. And, oh, actually, I was just speaking to Federico um, Pistono, who is our Italian a zeitgeist chap. Yeah, I know him. He's uh, He's been over in Taipei, and he actually sent an email yesterday I thought I'd read out. It, it dovetails quite nicely with your point about the irrational anger you were feeling, which was yeah. you know, some part due to the, the, the kind of diet you were, you were leading. Mm. And this is what he said. Um, he said that the person speaking after him at the Taipei conference was a, a Stanford professor called Scott Rosell, who's worked in rural China for 35 years, and he shared some very deeply disturbing data. As much as 60% of students in some areas suffered from anemia or had worms in their belly. Right. Comparative studies with various districts, students who got a $0.1 pill, in other words, 10 cent pill, were cured and their scores increased dramatically at school. In other words, this, this isn't exactly anger, but it's part of this social pathology that the Zeitgeist movement speaks about quite a lot. Um, and it's, it, it also plays into the whole hand of why are we even talking about nutrition on a show that's meant to be, it's meant to be about economics, isn't it? You know, that's, that's yeah. the thing that people lead with. Whereas actually, the more I'm looking at this, the more I'm seeing that behavior, self-image, um, uh, advertising standards, uh, and just quality of life and health and the concomitant effects of that, that ill health upon the wider society. Come on, man. Is this not relevant? <laughs> Can I? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I, I think it's, a, uh, well, just going back on my own personal experience, uh, I, I, well, when I say I was clinically depressed, I was also getting burps of uh, irrational anger, uh, very violent um, thought uh, ideation, and it was coming from nowhere, and I couldn't put my finger down on it. 
And um, uh, then basically, when I did the Atkins diet, about six weeks into it, I woke up one day, and the only way I can describe this to you, Ben, is as if I won the lottery, Christmas, and my birthday all rolled into one. Uh, or maybe I felt like a child when a child is really excited and full of curiosity. I honestly woke up that day, and I felt like unbelievable. And it was such a profound shift. In, uh, now, the thing is, of course, the way the subjective nature when you're experiencing these things, when you get a dramatic shift in the beginning, it's much more noticeable. And then after a while, you, 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 know, you try and chase and say, I want to feel like that again. But it doesn't come back because you basically moved to a different milieu. But what it made me realize was that my brain was severely malfunctioning. And, um, and I think, now I'm not as low carb as Atkins or anything like that. My ideas and what I've done to myself have evolved somewhat. So um, you have a number of talking points, um, having listened to last week's show, which was on yeah. the, the vegetarian um, approach to nutrition. Mm. Um, and you, you've been good enough to send me a few of these in advance, which is a good job because I wasn't familiar with them at all. Okay. So the thing that really caught my eye, and it is actually the thing I read first as well, was something called the expensive tissue hypothesis. Can you describe this in terms for our listeners who may not have ever heard of this before? Yeah, it's a paper by Leslie A. Leo, I think his name is, and uh, Peter Wheeler. Uh, it's in the Journal of Current Anthropology. I think it's one of the most highly cited um, papers. And it discusses uh, a number of uh, things based on a law called Kleiber's Law. And now, Kleiber's Law allows us to predict the size, the basal metabolic rate dependent on the mass. There's a very tight, directly proportional correlation. Uh, this is why it's a law. It's not a hypothesis. It's not a um, theory. It's a law. So it's yet, you know, it's it's uh, it's holding out well at the moment. But we, you know, we could come across a mammal tomorrow the size of the moon, and we can tell through Kleiber's law what its basal metabolic rate would be, provided it's a homeothermic mammal. You know, now uh, the expensive tissue hypothesis. Now, I'm going to give you the sock puppet version. If anybody wants to look into it, I, I suggest they look up the paper themselves. But like I was mentioning earlier, if we look at a, a, a chimpanzee, same size as myself, uh, our brains, uh, our basal metabolic rates are the same, but our organs and tissues are somewhat different. And in the human being, it's predominantly the brain, up to 25% uh, of metabolic activity is done in the brain. And... Uh, but our guts, um, basically what it's saying is that our guts have to shrink uh, in order for the growth of brain. Because if one, in percentage terms, if one variable goes up, another has to go down. Something has to give. Um, that's the basics of it. Now, you have to go look into the paper itself because it actually ties in a lot of other things, uh, such as um, austral, australopithecine, which is one of our ancestors. Um, I think it was around about 4 million years ago, if I remember correctly. Uh, and through Clive's law and what have you, we can also assume, you know, uh, we can make certain assumptions about its uh, biology as well. In turn. And we know that our brain size has grown since australopithecine. However, it seems that in the last 100 years, we see, uh, our brains seem to be deencephalizing a little bit, which might explain why we're into things. So the, the reason about the extensive tissue hypothesis, I mean, feel free to stop me, Ben, if I'm not being if I'm not clear enough. Let me recap to make sure yeah. I understand this correctly. So what we've seen is in the, the larger hominids that yeah. have broadly formed the lower branches of the tree of life that belongs to where we come from, yeah. uh, the largest significant um, development in our physiology, the thing that has in, fa in fact baffled uh, evolutionary um, uh, scientists even up to the present day, the people who reject this thesis still have to come up with their own explanation. The, the big change is in the size of our brain. It doubles in, what, a couple of couple of hundred thousand years. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I've read some place that we probably reached its peak at about 90,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, so, but, but that's, again, that's open to contention. Of course, yeah, absolutely. The brains yeah. don't change. And, of course, we, we know that brains are made in, in, of incredibly tissue, for one. Yes. Yeah. Point out a lot of it's um, cholesterol. Exactly. Which makes the idea of a low cholesterol diet an interesting one. I heard um, Jan Irving from Gnostic Media make this point once. Actually, he said that uh, might it not be an interesting comment upon um, social control that we're demanded to have very very low 
fat diet? Is that not interfering with our brain? Is that not shrinking our mass? I don't know, but it's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, it does sound a touch conspiratorial, but um, I, I have no way of proving that. Um, but, however, a, a, probably a better conspiracy or profit motive induced behavior would be maybe that um, with the invention of the electric light bulb, uh, candles, uh, you know, cottonseed oil, canola oil um, used to be used in candles. Um, well, when the electric light bulb came along, uh, I think a lot of these cottonseed manufacturers and oils thought, well, how do we, I know, let's tell people, let's eat, um, you know, animal fats are bad for you, eat um, candle wax. The other side of this theory as well, so the, the brain gets bigger on one side, but of course, like you point out, um, in order for a, 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 a being of any kind, including a human being, to be, uh, to be able to survive, it has to give way in somewhere else, especially if it's going to be um, wanting long-term survival. And that shrinkage has only been found in our the GI tract, the, the gastrointestinal tract. That's now, right. what, does, what does that mean? What does that entail? If our GI tract gets smaller, what's happened? Okay, so if we compare um, herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores in their gut lengths, relative to their body mass, carno, uh, body length, the, the gut length, the GI tract, is longer in... Uh, herbivores, particularly ruminant herbivores like cows and sheep. And then when you go to the opposite end of the spectrum and you look at obligate carnivores, hypercarnivores like, you know, elephants, seals, what have you, uh, their um, gut lengths are considerably short. And if we look at, say, a cat, it's essentially mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, anus, basically. Uh, if we look at um, uh, a cow, you know, it, 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 the, first of all, it's got, uh, I've forgotten what the name of this first stomach's called now, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, the cow, you know, it, it, it brings up the cud and it chews one piece of grass 200 times, but uh, it goes in for fermentation. Now, we have acidic stomachs, which aren't very good for fermentation as well. Um, so, you know, our stomachs are kind of designed to kill bacteria rather than to, and to also uh, allow enzyme act, uh, protein, protease activity in the um, stomach to break down protein. Um, going back to, I mentioned earlier on about chimpanzees having protuberant bellies, and that's because their large intestines, as opposed to our large intestines, um, uh, or casum for want of a better term, uh, is um, there's this larger, because it's more meant for fermentation of plant matter than ours. Uh, so if you look at where humans kind of lie on the spectrum of... Uh, from herbivores to omnivores to uh, carnivores, obligate carnivores, we're sort of, it's sit between, in between, we're more carnivorous than pigs and less so than dogs, basically, is the fundamentals of it. That's, the again, a crude sock, um, sock puppet version of it. But if we look, I mean, in fact, there's now been recent studies I've seen seem to indicate there seems to be some divergence between human populations in, like, the large intestine length or the colon length, only minimal, but there may be now uh, some changes going on. But between mammals, uh, of all the organ structures in, in a mammal, the most plastic, evolutionary plastic, I would say, is the gut. And in fact, most mammals, as far as I'm aware, eat a high-fat diet. Uh, so a cow, if we look at grass, there's bugger all carbohydrates or uh, fat in it, well, some, but minimal, and what the cow does is it lets bacteria act upon it, turn it into short-chain fatty acids, and then the cow has got the enzymes to assimilate these fatty acids into long-chain fatty acids, which we can assimilate. Interesting. It, it um, brings about the point, doesn't it, that whether you're a ruminant or whether you're a meat-eater, or whatever your life form is, the reason that you have, at least up to now, the features that you have is because there was the space in nature and the space in your body for it to allow to happen. Yes. Uh, presumably the very the pre cows didn't go with the several bellies or that for some reason that branch never developed it don't exist anymore or never did exist because it wouldn't have worked uh, yeah so I, think uh, I mean ultimately we're no I was only going to say the, the, the ultimate um, the, the, the post you sent me and it's something I'll link in the show notes as well the, the very interesting thing that comes from this realization is that it's not so much that we evolved to eat meat, but that it's because of meat that we managed to evolve the brains we did. Yes, it explains the how as opposed to the why. Yeah. 
Now, my next question, and it'll be the next, it'll be the question of all the vegans as well, because what you're essentially talking about here is a high fat diet, meat, and all the rest of it is, can we imagine a scenario in which all of the preceding is true, all the preceding is, is proven and accepted, where there is a type of diet we can have now that doesn't rely on meat, but that still is, let's say, rich enough to allow for the, the, the development of our brain the way it is and the, the functioning of our brain the way it is, taking up, as it does, the quarter of our expendable energy, uh, but which might not be meat-based? Uh, well, let's look at the oldest populations of um, vegetarians in the world. Uh, uh, I'm a, uh, ethnically a Punjabi, uh, Hindu Punjabi or whatever that is, and... Um, uh, and there's a lot of my parents. I actually grew up in a pretty much a, a, a more vegetarian environment than most kids, I would say, uh, in Britain. Um, uh, I think my father kind of encouraged some meat eating, but my mother, for religious reasons, uh, was a vegetarian. I, I have a large extended family, um, and uh, a lot of the women in my family, unfortunately, particularly amongst my parents' generation, are unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, now, I'm not saying uh, they, they tended to be the vegetarians. Um, now, it's not saying that vegetarianism made them die early. What I'm saying is, is that it seems to produce a less of a physically resilient organism. Uh, uh, so, no, in systems theory, we talk about uh, resilience. And our bodies are um, resilient. You know, uh, so our, our bodies are systems. And we're trying to make our systems as resilient as possible. I tried to simplify nutrition on the level of we, you know, looking at what we need to eat. But if you're healthy, I think there's more leeway in what you can get away with. But if you're unhealthy, then it requires different strategies. Um, sorry, I forgot what your question was. Um, well, my question was this, and it, it, it might dovetail to your next point, um, yeah. which I've done less reading, and so I want you to school yeah. me particularly. And that is the idea of restricted calorie intake diets. Mm. Uh, where you're essentially, as far as I can tell, please correct me immediately if I'm wrong, which I yeah. probably, it seems to be the restriction of um, calorie-based foods in uh, and uh, the supplanting of those with the uh, supplements which would contain the nutrients which you were eating the food for to begin with, not just purely for energy reasons. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, so I actually remember what your uh, previous question was, and this is another point I wanted to get to. At the moment, for vegans and vegetarians, sorry, for, um, when I was talking about the Indian populations, Indians have been doing vegetarianism the longest, but ghee has been the ultimate fat. And unfortunately, in a lot of Indian populations, they've been told, oh, don't eat uh, ghee because it contains saturated fat and cholesterol, gives you heart disease. So their only source of fat-soluble animal analogs are fat-soluble vitamins and animal fat was taken away and they were put on these stupid vegetable seed oils. And I think this has partly explained some of the explosion in diabetes, cancer, heart disease. Um, there's studies, one by Dr. Malhotra in the 60s, where he compared Madrasis, uh, southern India, from, uh, who ate a predominantly vegetarian diet with peanut oil as the main cooking oil, versus uh, northern Indian Samudapo who were at, at that time in the 60s, they had the highest butterfat consumption in the world. And the Madrasis had eight times the levels of cardiac mort you know, mortality um, uh, to the um, northern Indians. Now, obviously, it's an observational study, so it doesn't show a mechanism. But uh, I know of all the dietary insults, I think, that people frequently engage in, it's the incorrect fatty acid consumption. Um, fats are hydrophobic. And it's that property of them that when you put fat in water, it allows, uh, you know, it beads up. It doesn't mix with water. Fat and oil doesn't mix. And it's that property that makes our cell membranes. All our, our cell membranes are made out of lipids, fats. So it should follow that if you're eating the wrong kinds of fats, you have bad cells, bad tissues, bad organs, bad body. This is something that Dave Asprey from the Proof Executive has talked about as well. Yeah, I like that guy. He does some good stuff. You see, yes, I, I do think he, he does have some, he, he has very good posts on his blog that link very diligently to all of the information. I think there's a little bit too much of a salesman to him for me to trust him completely. I, I understand, but That's I think he means well. He, he, yeah, he does, I think he does mean well. And he also, he actually does the sales job quite well as well because he says, you know, buy it from me, but you could buy it from somewhere else. You know, he does say that. Yeah. And I think in this era of, of, of in 
internet cynicism, I think that's the only way to be a good salesman, ironically. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll say it right out now. I've actually used, I use his coffee, funny enough. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I used to drink all the other coffees, and I used to make me feel jittery and what have you. I know it too well not to be placebo, and um, yeah, I, I do very well on it. Let, let me explain what I do uh, and about how I got to what I'm doing today, uh, obviously through a lot of trial and error. So I, I tend to have that coffee in the morning. I've only been doing this now for, for nearly a year, the bulletproof kind of protocol. Um, but I'm, I'm not as um, uh, worried about some of the other stuff as he is. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I find that I concentrate a lot better. I think some people, and I think I'm one of them, uh, ketosis is good for my mood. I'm a lot more emotionally stable when I'm in a significant amount of ketosis. Describe, uh, can you describe to the listeners what ketosis is? It came up yeah. right last week, but they may yeah. not. I think uh, mass, uh, well, ketosis is just the production of ketone bodies from fatty acid um, metabolism. When you wake up in the morning, you're in a mild state of ketosis. I think what Matt was conflating, because he was trying to hint that it was dangerous, was a state, a pathological state called ketoacidosis. And that occurs in uncontrolled type 1 diabetics and people in the final st um, stages of starvation. Uh, now, you know, if you're not eating any carbs or anything for a day, I think you're hardly going to die. So uh, most of us are going to fatten our asses to, um, you know, <laughs> to metabolize over a few weeks, you know, uh, about a week or two, you know. So, uh, yeah, so... Uh, and, and this is the other thing about how fat has been demonized, you know, animal fats in particular and cholesterol, is that, you know, your heart has a band of palmitic acid, um, 18 carbon length uh, saturated fats around it. And it, I think it can yield, if I remember correctly, I think it's something like 129 ATP from that one molecule. Do you know what ATP is? It's the energy currency of our cells. So please explain. Uh, yeah, well, in the crudest terms, um, every day you turn over probably your body weight in ATP. Okay, just think about that for a second. You know, so, uh, that's a lot of ATP you're producing. If your ATP production stopped for a fraction of a second, you'd be dead. Uh, it's, it's, um, all it is is just a molecule, and it has a very exothermic third bond between the, uh, uh, the um, phosphate bond and it's just recycled into ADP, ATP. And we do the citric acid cycle, beta oxidation in, in mitochondria. Uh, citric acid cycle uh, happens in the cytosol uh, of the cell. But as, what I'm trying to say is, is that essentially when you're burning fats, you're not, sorry, when you're not burning fats, you're burning sugar all of the time. You're not using your mitochondria so much. And there is an unwritten law, so to speak, in biology, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I think a lot of people who are eating every three to four hours, particularly highly refined carbohydrates, those kinds of foods, uh, are not accessing their mitochondria for fuel, ATP generation sufficiently. But I think saturated fat in particular is clean burning fuel for your cells. Uh, this is, again, a very soft topic. I don't know how far we want to go because I don't want to do like two hours of pronouncing long names of like various molecules and things. So gets... Don't worry about that. That's good. It's good, I think, to touch on the subject area. So from one, we, we now have an evolutionary pressure partially explained by our reliance on meat and, and more, more nutritionally dense foods than the traditional uh, vegetables that got us here. Yeah. Uh, where, do you, can you foresee, given what Matt and Thomas were talking about last week, which was the strain of the agricultural production vehicle upon making meat, in other words, Mm. 10 pounds of grain make a pound of meat and don't even start on the amount of water. How, 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 what's your view on this? What do you think about in terms of the capacity yeah. of meat production as a rationale for coming to some conclusion about its viability? Right. I mean, this is outside of my domain of expertise, but from what I've... Right, I live in South Wales. Um, as anybody knows anything about Wales, there's plenty of sheep here. And um, if we look... Um, Say, uh, I live in Cardiff, but to the north of me are uh, a series of mountains, you know, the South Wales Valleys, the Brecon Beacons. Now, if I, I, let's say I own a mountain and I want to grow something on it. If I want to grow grain, what am I going to do to that soil, first of all? I have to till it, so I have to add in inputs, whether organic or not, but I'm still going to have to add in inputs. 
Well, alternatively, I could just chuck some uh, sheep on there who happen to poo on the grass, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, bugs start feeding in. I could maybe even throw some chickens on there then, and the chickens can eat the bugs. Um, I, I, you know, I, you know. Ultimately, we're animals, and you know, heterotrophs, autotrophs, what have you. We're heterotrophs, and um, I, I, I just don't see you're, you're competing uh, in various micro niches like the soil and uh, you know the, the things that other animals could be living on. I mean, and let's face it, we human beings are, you know, because of our adaptable nature, we're exploiting all of these ecological niches. How many more bloody ecological niches do we need to compete with other life forms, and particularly those lower down on the food chain? Um, also, you know, yes, I'm against, um, you know, these confined area feedlot operations. I think they're an abomination. Um, but equally, we're chopping down, and I'm also against chopping down rainforest and things for, you know, meat production. But I'm also against chopping down rainforest for palm oil production as well. Uh, you know, we can't run away from the fact that plants production is is just as destructive as animal production, uh, you know, uncontrolled animal um, food production. But the, the, but, but point there, that's a very good point, and it's one that the listener must um, assimilate, is yeah. that it can be unsustainable about any type of diet. Yes. Um, and, and this is the thing, it's, it, you know, we're dealing with systems, aren't we, and they scale up. And, you know, I haven't even begun to mention, you know, for example, the ecosystem that's in your gut. I mean, we're, we're basically messing up the probiotics of the earth just by using monoculture, uh, you know, growing, you know, acres and acres as far as the eye can see of GMO modified corn and what have you. And then we're spraying pesticides, fungicide. Uh, you know, going back to Dave Asprey, he points out about mycotoxin uh, problems with that. Are, are you familiar with that one? I have. I've, I understand that he uses the absence of mycotoxins as a selling point for his coffee. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't found too much information. Would you want to well, explain what's going yeah. on? Yeah. Well, when I first came across there, I thought, oh bloody hell, this is orthorexic. And it wasn't until I started looking into the veterinary science side of it, and farmers and all these guys know this very well. Um, you know, particularly the the you know uh, uh, CAFO style. Um, meat producers. They know that, uh, in fact, I was researching, looking into mycotoxin, I saw one on Google News, just not that long ago, of 135 people, I think in Ghana, died from eating maize that had, like, mycotoxin in the past per million. I also have a friend whose wife uh, is a, uh, she goes to food factories and tests for various things, and she tests for mycotoxin as well. I think in the States there's less regulation because of the blooded free market than there is in other parts of the world. But, um, Yes, I, I, uh, I think it's a major confounding variable because we, the, I think as Dave Asprey says, because we've been spraying fungicide on these um, organisms, they've basically undergone X-Men style evolution. And, you know, they're not being evil or anything, they're just trying to survive. And the only way they can sort of, you know, when a fungi lands on something, it tends to poison the area around it so that it can consume and keep other organ, microorganisms off it. Um, and they've just basically, and because of modern food processing, transport, and what have you, so say you're buying a chocolate bar, and the chocolate may have come from various sources from around the planet, and the transportation and everything, you're mixing mycotoxins in. And in, bi in biological systems, there's sometimes you know a lot of synergies between toxins and um, and nutrients for that matter. So yeah. It, it demands further investigation, but there's some very interesting books on it, and um, I think one's called Fungal Bionics or something like that. That's quite an interesting one. But yeah, so again, uh, uh, this is, and I've noticed it myself. I, I've been doing uh, quite a lot of self quantification regarding brain performance, and I've noticed certain foods affect my brain performance quite radically, um, uh, particularly wheat in myself. I'm going to know for sure, by the way, Ben, because I'm going to have a, uh, an SMP test uh, done soon. Oh, right. Yeah, so... Uh, that, How does that uh, do? Uh, so one of the websites is 23andMe, and it just measures um, single nucleotide polymorphism. So it's, it's not like a full genome map, but it just looks at the most well-known poly, allele polymorphisms in um, th that we currently know, basically. So remember, genes aren't deterministic. 
uh, but their exp expression is affected by your environment. So, so at least you can find out. You know, hopefully, I'll be able to find out if I'm carrying the gene uh, that makes me more, you know, say, predisposed to issues with gluten. And things like that. I've been uh, wanting to get from 23andMe for a while because they just dropped their prices. It's the sequencing of your, your genome, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, but, but you can do other stuff with it as well. That's right, yeah, you can use it for like, if you know what you're doing, I guess. But they also they screen for like several hundred common ailments or, or known, known um, what is it? Things like the BRCA1 gene, the, the gene that made Angie yeah. go a double mastectomy ahead of time. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't get it because they price from $1,000 to $99. And I was like, I can afford one for the whole family, surely, if I save up a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. Me and my friend, um, I think it was 18% off the second kit. So between me and my friend, it's $99 in the US, but including postage and packing um, across the Atlantic for us, it still came in at like £99, £98, including that. So it's still so quite, quite affordable. Well, compared to 10 years ago, that thing would have cost you a, ton, a bucket of money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Do you um, so so once you have found out your did you say it was an SMP? What's, what's yeah, that? single nucleotide polymorphism test. There are different genetic tests, but this one just looks at. The, and the other thing is about it: you can take the raw data and you can upload it to certain websites like Prometheus and Genetic Genie, and they they're constantly updating the knowledge base. Uh, with the uh, you know with uh, with information regarding these various mutations, right. morphisms. Uh, it, it's a bit complicated to go into. It's probably worth doing as another show in itself. I'll probably be able to help you with that in a few months once I've looked into it myself. But um, you know, uh, it, 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 it you know what, what I'm trying to impress upon people is I, I think it's a bit incorrect for people to have a a one size fits all diet. I can give you a real-world example of something I've done recently. Um, I've cleared it with him. I asked him if it was okay to talk about it. And it's about a guy within the Zygos movement, Cardiff. His name is Gavin, and uh, he came to one of our meetings. And he mentioned to me that he had Tourette's. And he said that his Tourette's was essentially um, getting worse as he was getting older. Now, from that, I could infer that there must have been an underlying pathology that is progressive, on a on a on a cellular level, I think there was problems with his cellular energetics regarding his nervous system. So now I, I left it for a while. I didn't give it much thought. But I bought a device, a near infrared hemoencephalography machine. It's a wonderful word, rolls off the tongue. All it is. It, you must have the most astonishing house filled with bizarre <laughs> things. <man. laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people do say, uh, uh, "Yeah, what are you on?" Basically, but um, so anyway. Um, I bought this device. All it does, it measures oxygen levels in your brain uh, over a certain site uh, using infrared light. And um, uh, then you plug it into a computer and, and you just got to look at an animation that's going backwards and will it to go forwards. And, um, and the only way it can go forwards is by your brain sending more oxygen to that part of the brain. But because the feedback loop is less than 300 milliseconds, it has to be about that speed to basically form an effective feedback uh, loop for the nervous system. You're essentially forming a mirror for the brain. And once the brain can see itself, it starts to self-optimize. And that's pretty cool. So anyway, I did it to myself and I found improvements in mood, focus, attention. But I didn't know, like, I, I thought maybe I spent over a thousand pounds on this. Maybe it's just me, placebo effect, trying to justify it. So I thought, well, I need a guinea pig because you know, this is non-pharmacological and I think it's just, you know, it's not going to do anything bad to anybody. And uh, so I thought, yeah, I'll think of Gav because he's got Tourette's. Maybe this might help. So anyway, I phoned him up and I said, do you want to be a guinea pig and what have you? And just to cut a long story short, basically, um, doing that heart rate variability training and putting him on a ketogenic diet, not that dissimilar to the Bulletproof diet. He's got some do dietary dogma, by the way. He doesn't eat red meat, things like that, okay? So working within his own constraints, uh, by the way, I should mention he um, he's over t he was over 20 stone when we started about five months ago, uh, oh. and he was also highly inflamed as well. He's six foot two, um, but he was getting about his major. Now, I don't know if you know about Tourette's, but the tics can vary in severity from just say a facial tic to say you know uh, prior, uh, aberrated behaviour patterns. But his major tic was he'd go whoopity doo, space cadet, and. 
a lot of the time in his head, internally, he's going, what did you do, space cadet? What did you do, space cadet? What did you do, space cadet? And sometimes it doesn't emerge in, in, in a verbal tick. But still, what the hell is going on with your brain when it's doing something like that? It so, sounds, it sounds like my kind of hell, because my brain is noisy anyway. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. I just shut up. Uh, I, I, I had that. that. I, I've had those issues too myself. And that's why I prefer being, for a large extent of the day, in ketogenesis. Uh, sorry, in a ketotic state. Um, but uh, but um, cause I find uh, uh, it really helps to reduce the noise in my mind, basically. Um, but going back to Gavin, basically within several weeks, it, it, you wouldn't know he had Tourette's if you didn't know he had Tourette's. Um, it went from 40 ticks a day as an average, something like that, um, down to about maybe two a week, if that. And that's in five months. That's amazing, huh? That's amazing. I never thought that in some individuals, surely it can't be in all individuals, that, but no. it's so heavily dietarily linked. Amazing. Yeah, so what I think is actually going on, I try to look at diet, is, is yeah, supply the body what it needs, but inflammation, apart from, you know, aside from congenital diseases, in, it, most disease pathologies have their basis in inflammation. And uh, so if you can tackle the inflammation, then the body can repair and regenerate better, I think. And you're, you're changing the metabolic milieu. Now, I eat more carbs than I used to uh, because I only typically eat in the night. So I have a coffee maybe in the morning. I, I really don't think about food. Uh, you know, in previous workplaces, people say to me, are oh, you a camel? Because we never see you eating lunch, you know, and stuff like that. But I don't get that mid-afternoon. That's for me. That, that's what I can do. I'm not saying everybody should do what I do. But that's just because I've been doing the low-carb thing for long enough or moderate to low-carb. So I've kind of adapted to it, you know. So, um, but, you know, going back to the fasting benefits as well, the caloric restriction. Now, there's different ways around about it, but, like, I think intermittent fasting is the best one. And typically, people who can low-carb and eat nutrient-dense food, that's the important thing, nutrient-dense food, are much, because their body are getting the nutrients they need, they don't have to think about food every three to four hours. Give me an example of a very nutrient-dense food. Well, let's test your knowledge. Um, what would you say is the most nutrient-dense food for human beings? Uh, I'm going to probably spoil it for you through my oh. reading. And say it's probably going to be grass-fed liver. No, no, well done. Excellent. Yeah, so I agree. Maybe, you know, you could argue maybe intestine, tripe, or kidney, or maybe even brain, perhaps. But it really is awful, essentially. Awful. It's essentially awful, yes. And now, why would that be? Well, there we go. I mean, why did we start eating animals and things like that? You know, um you know, there's a program called Fit Day, and you can just type it. You know, you can just type in foodstuffs or, or whole foods and what have you, and it'll give you a nutritional breakdown. And if you look at the, particularly the fat soluble vitamins found in animal fats, um, those there's also the thiols like glutathione, things like this, which is one of your body's indigenous antioxidants. Unfortunately, when you eat glutathione, it gets digested in the gut, but still the precursors can be recycled uh, into it. Uh, uh, the other thing as well, sorry, going back to protein as well, I think one of the things uh, a lot of people make the problem when, when look at discussing macronutrients is that they think all protein is the same. But, you know, I, I could eat rattlesnake venom, that's protein, or I could eat, you know, a steak. There's two different proteins, isn't there? And with plants, a lot of the secondary metabolites in a plant are defensive compounds. And cooking, in a way, not all food is better cooked. Some foods are better raw. But some foods, we, we, we humans do pre-digest our food by cooking, fermentation, and other techniques. That's what we've always, you know, historically done. That's, That's essentially what it is. Is that the role that cooking mostly plays? Then? Well, it's chemistry, ultimately, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, like any chemical reaction, what temperature, you know, I, 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 you know, the interesting thing I learned from uh, Dave Asprey as well is the formation of biogenic amines from cooking meat above 160 degrees C. Uh, that's a pretty bad move. Mind you, I like my pork crackling. I don't know about you. But <laughs> for 220 <laughs> in the first 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain things I don't eat anymore. Yeah. Um, and one of them is I try and I, I've cut dairy out of my diet almost completely. Okay. Every now and again, I cave and have a pizza. So it's not completely true. But I don't buy cheese. I don't buy milk. I don't okay. buy cream. Uh, those just aren't in my, in my fridge um, because I'm afraid that if they are, I'll eat them. But that was that was mostly due to the, the fat content. 
I only recently realized, and the listener may not know this, that when they write 5% fat on the side of your um, semi-skimmed uh, milk, it's not 5% of the bottle is fat. Um, by weight, it's 5% fat. By calorie intake, it's 50% fat. Right, yeah. Which That's I didn't right. realize. And yeah. No other, uh, or very few other uh, uh, um, foodstuffs are labeled in this way for that reason. They yeah. all, of course, label on it that there's white blood cells, or pus as we call it, in milk. Cause they don't put that in either. In yeah. Fact, there's no ingredient that's in milk at all because yeah. it's just considered milk. It's this wonderful short short idea that we have we just call yeah something and we don't uh, really... I, I think I, yeah you're right I, I think sorry uh that with milk particularly in the west it's been bastardized terribly and um you know and adulterated in so many forms i think I, i'm going to have cut it away yeah i, I th- you know going back to vegetarians you know the indians have been doing it longest and they relied on ghee as a source of animal fat in order to you know there's enough indians on the face of the planet um <laughs> they must have done something right, you know, uh, in the evolutionary sense. So, um, uh, you know, so I think it's just, if you're not getting the right fats, and I'm afraid the easiest way to do it is to get the animal fats. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think dairy is a very convenient form, particularly in the form of ghee or butter, uh, of getting the fat-soluble vitamins. And there's another fat that's also found, uh, uh, you know, a good clue at looking at human nutritional needs is to look at breast milk, human breast milk. You know, what's in human breast milk? You know, it's about 30% carbohydrates. Um, I don't know many people, you know, although it's high in fat, you know, in healthy female breast milk, um, it's about 30% carbohydrate. So I think the upper limit, obviously babies' need, in, in nutritional needs are slightly different to an adult's. But then again, we're not, you know, caterpillars that metamorphosize into butterflies, are we? So recently asked somebody who works at a zoo how they do that. And can you believe that we still don't really understand why or how? Not, not no, why. I haven't looked into it. Yeah, from a yeah. butterfly is not understood as well. At least she claimed uh, that the, the medical the literature was that. Let me yeah. at this point of um, uh, protein content uh, or indeed the content of milk. You're absolutely right. Human breast milk does have a level of, of proteins um, which is suitable to the human being. Cow's milk has much more protein. Um, and then horses and dogs have even higher levels of protein in their milk. And the, 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 the variable that fits with this is the amount of time it takes for them to essentially get on their legs and be mobile yeah. uh, and how quickly they gestate as well. It, it, basically, how quickly they grow up. Sorry, the, the, I, I should rephrase this. It's the length of time for them, for they, for them to take to double their length. So the, the length of time it takes for a puppy to double in size uh, versus the, the length of time it takes for us to double in size when we're babies is actually inversely proportional to the amount of protein. The higher the protein, the shorter the doubling size. We are yeah. very, very far away from dogs and horses. So yeah. the answer and it dovetails with Matt's point from last week. High amounts of protein without the right amount of calcium as well will suck calcium out of your body. You know, when we're talking about protein requirements, uh, vegetarian sources of protein are typically low in the sulfur-based amino acids. And I think that can have interesting secular on our biochemistry as well. It's really bloody complex. I'm looking into this a bit more. I, I came across this whilst researching for it. And um, so I think the quality of protein isn't as, as good. I only eat it, uh, uh, one piece of meat a day. I don't eat a leg of lamb every day. I, I probably have... You know, one day I might eat a pound of fish, another day I might eat about 200 grams of liver, another day I might, you know, uh, every area. Um, ironically, I think steak is probably the least nutritious part of the animal. It's interesting with the Inuit and some American plain Indians and people, uh, you know, hunter-gatherers who hunt uh, modalities of um, of, so, uh, of uh, social arrangements, they, they basically eat about... Sorry, they eat with the animal. They eat every part of the animal, and they throw the meat, the steak, basically to the dogs, the muscle meat. You know, that's, that's it. Yeah. So I, I don't think. So as in terms of protein requirements, sorry Ben, mm-hmm. uh, you, we can only burn fat and carbohydrate. We can't burn significant amounts of protein. Um, if you look at early um, European settlers, trappers, trapping rabbits in North America they started getting something called rabbit fever because they weren't getting enough fat or carbohydrate or both to metabolize the protein. 
so they died of kidney and liver failure. So yes, too much protein is a bad thing. But what are the ranges? And I can I would say quite comfortably between fifteen and thirty percent for most people. Okay. But uh, if you look at say uh, red meat, typically for every hundred grams, it's about nineteen grams uh, protein. Very good. Um, can we uh, jump to another topic I wanted to touch on, and yeah. that is the topic of Alan Savory. Mm. You sent me – this man is new to me as of today. Um, yes. Uh, you sent me a video of his where he speaks about the uh, link between ruminants or cattle or livestock, if to, be, to be more general, um, and the soil degradation. And he has – on his Wikipedia page, in the talk, and as the headline, or at least byline of his life, the unfortunate history that back, what, 25 years ago, he was advocating the mass slaughter of uh, elephants, and, yeah. bison, and I, it makes me shudder to even think of it now, because back then they really did believe, and to some degree we still do very much believe that it's the uh, topsoil erosion is, is in a great part caused by the ruminants that feed on the on the on the topsoil, and so this man was advocating a, a basically a holocaust for for wonderful African animals, and it has since, of course, come to the realization through various elements of his uh, science that it was utterly unnecessary, and in fact, uh, ruminants appear to be required to keep our topsoil. Is that the case? I I think he's onto something really big, Ben. Um... Because that's uh, this, a big uh, headline, isn't sorry? it? This is a big headline against yeah. the the uh, agricultural industry. Now, of course, we're not to, to be to be going into this line of inquiry. We're not advocating the feedlot, um, you know, earthling style million cow concentration camp uh, or or the ones that are used on on any animal. This is, of course, cruel on its face. It doesn't matter if it's sustainable. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's bad for us. We know that because it's a very awful way of producing the kinds of meats, uh, or the, even the kinds of butter and eggs that we would want to consume if we were that way inclined. Even Dave Asprey points this out. Different kinds of fats are made if you force feed cows. Uh, not only all the ridiculous hormones that make them digest grain, but grain. Um, so we're not advocating that. We're not going down that road. But I do think this is a very interesting point about environmental attitudes and and systems theory understanding of agriculture. So would you like to describe what? what Alan Savory is advocating, what he has found, what he talks about, and maybe a couple of keywords that people can search the internet with for him? Yeah, um, I think his institute is called the Savory Institute. It won the Buckminster Fuller Award in 2010. Um, and I would invite anybody to watch his TED Talk or his videos online if you're not familiar with it, because, um, you, you know, you hinted there about the eventual... Uh, the problem is, is this. Uh, I think Matt used this um, in in the previous uh, show, that you know cows emit a lot of methane and thus warm up the planet or what have you. Now, this is a reductionist way of looking at things, and I think it's the problem is, is when we're not looking at nature's complex web of nature, you know, in a reductionist way, we tend to pin problems on one link in the chain, and this also applies to nutrition as well, Ben. You know, uh, the body is a complex system and we're doing that. But going back to Alan Savory, what he proposes, it doesn't work in every environment, but in any area where it's desertifying, and according to him, it's about two-thirds of the land mass of the planet is desert or desertifying, which I find terrifying, if that's the case. Um, uh, but he thinks that through the utilization of um Migrate, you know, using livestock in gigantic herds so they can defecate and urinate over um, so over the soil. They can basically increase biodiversity, restore topsoil um, in various areas of the world. And I think he mentions, and the punchline is, is basically they think that uh, we can restore carbon levels, atmospheric carbon levels, pre-industrial revolution times if we just ameliorated half of the desertification using these methods. That's now, a very arresting claim, isn't it? That is. Even if it was only, let's say it was 50% off, I still think that's something worth bloody chasing. Mm. Uh, um, you know, uh, it may be the only tool, you know, aside from some of these more uh, fancy geoengineering ideas, which I still think are very reductionist in approach. I'll, I'll support you on that one. I was flying 
back from Amsterdam on Friday, and I mm-hmm. sat to a gentleman um, whom I ultimately started getting to talk to, and he turns out he's a climate scientist who just come back from the International Panel on Climate Change, which has been hitting our airwaves ever since. Mm-hmm. And in fact, he is a talking head on the subject too. Um, I won't give his name out, even though he is a public person. Um, although I suppose I, I suppose I could. For, well, if anybody's desperately interested in who it was, they can write to me. Um, but uh, he, I asked him about geoengineering too. In fact, I asked him about a lot of things. There was somebody recently posted a, a, a story that was probably from the Daily Mail because it was wrong, uh, where they talk about how there's been record ice growth in the in the North Pole and therefore what climate change, what global warming. Mm. And I said straight away, look, you know, did the did it double or whatever? Did it grow by the largest amount ever? And he said, yes, it has, but that's because last year it was at record low levels. So you can get a you get a multi hundred percent increase on anything if the beginning number yes. where you started from was already at desperate red alert levels. So it's not a, a, a happy thing at all that they had a bit of a crisp winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing was though, but he really said geoengineering was 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 not enough. He didn't, he didn't side with the Bjorn Lomborg school on things. Um, even though I think it's great, I think there are so many con- con- corollary effects, concomitant effects that we aren't factoring in that probably would start you know, happening as well. But I really like the idea of the self-driving ships that fire steam into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, that's quite good. <laughs> they look nice. Yeah. You, you're not, a, you're not a, um, a particular advocate of that uh, level of tech, are you? No, I, I think... Um... Well, not that I claim to be an expert on these issues or anything like that, but um, what I like about Savory's approach, it's, it's, it's one tool in, in, in the toolkit, okay? So, but first of all, it, can, it helps to feed people high-quality nutrition. Secondly, it also helps with, um, you know, a lot of cultures have lost important facets of their relationship to the animals, of, you know, like the Maasai, not so much the Maasai, but other um, tribes around Africa and what have you. Uh, because basically they've been told by us clever clogs in the West, you know, animals are causing deserts and what have you. And look what happened in those areas. The deserts got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, you know, uh, in some of these farms, uh, there's farmers practicing savory's methods. And just look on his website at what the farms, the, the, the terrain looked like before and after. That's my challenge to anybody out there is look at that and tell me. Remember, we're carbon-based life forms, Yeah. So you can worry about the methane coming out of a cow's mouth or ass or whatever, but you can read, I, I would be more concerned about the, the lack of carbon being sequestered in the poo that goes into the soil, that becomes plants, that becomes other plants, becomes other animals. You know, and, uh, you know eight inches, uh, in some areas, it's feet of to- topsoil being recovered, you know, in depth. How much carbon over millions of hectares would that be? You know, sunk away. So I think I think this guy uh, is onto something. I, I have looked for um, opposing opinions. You know, is this guy a fraud? Is he talking out of his hat? And there, there's some convincing arguments saying otherwise, but I think these uh, tend to come from uh, the more, uh, shall we say, Monsanto farming lot. Yeah, sure. Who must be panicking because they've had some setbacks recently, haven't they, with the uh, being kicked out of all of Hungary and with the yes. first... Your farmer winning his battle against them. Yeah. The, uh, the, the the Monsanto debate. It's actually something that um, Rick Overton, the veteran comedian who's been host uh, to the Zeitgeist Media Festival a couple of times now in LA. He he always leads with it. He says, "Listen, there's one way to unite the, the the left and the right, and that is Monsanto. No one disagrees about Monsanto. This is a runaway corporation. It's a non-partisan issue." Yeah. Uh, yeah. But corporation is so out of control that yeah. it's not even psychopathic anymore. Psycho- psychopathy in, t- in the corporate world would be self-interest. But Monsanto yeah. can't be self-interested if it's literally destroying the entire world um, yes. to feed or commit suicide yeah. in generation. So, yeah. you know, I think it's, it's a particularly, it's the, it's the one company where I tend to focus on the company rather than on the systemic problems because yes. it's so, so large. <laughs> yes. So forward to develop, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, uh, it, it just shows the the power of systems thinking, doesn't it? That you can see that even relatively small, you know, in individual dietary choices done on a you know in a significant proportion of the population can have these weird and wonderful 
effects on the on the larger system of the planet. So, you know, in my fantasy, you know, of a perfect VVAX, perfect world, I'd probably like to see as much agriculture maybe moved into vertical farms, things like that. Uh, and then animals, yeah. I mean, if we're going to take their lives, then uh, at least let's give them uh, a very good environment to flourish for so many reasons, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, like a lot of the vegetarian community, and, and I, don't, I don't think you have to be a vegetarian, by the way, to, you know, uh, like animals, you know, I'm not saying that they say that, but, you know, yeah, I find the violence done against these creatures uh, in these certain feedlot um, situations abhorrent, but, um, you know, ultimately, I, I, you know, that's one of the reasons why I eat a lot of butter, actually, for a whole host of reasons, is that you don't, you're not actually forced to eat a lot of meat if you know how you're doing it, you know, or fish for that matter. I think that's one of the, that's one of the key things is, is, I think it's probably the best, um, argument I've heard so far from at least having a look at the vegan community, the uh, the paleo-ish community we probably should talk about paleo actually um, and uh, or what we mean by paleo and then by the, the hardcore the meat eaters or the fruitarians or I think they're called something else but if you compare it all, the one that keeps coming around the top is have a balanced diet where you don't eat a lot of particular things but you just eat a lot of everything like you eat well I would disagree with that not like uh, that? No, because first of all, if you look at the statement, eat a healthy, balanced diet or everything in moderation, it actually contains no information, really, that statement. You know, a lot of people have differing ideas of what moderate diets are, you know. I used to think that way myself, you know. But, I, you, know, uh, you know, some of us have allergies. Some of us, are, you know, some, you know I, I saw in a packet of food the other day, uh, not suitable for people with sesame seed allergy, you know. So, uh, I mean, of course, I, 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 I don't sound like I'm being reductionist to what you're, um, you know, giving you a reductionist answer to refute your point. But uh, I, I, I would say my diet, general dietary advice to most people is is eat the right kind of fats. Mm -hmm. Now, and how much that can be can vary. Find out for yourself. Do a bit of self experimentation. Um, you know, going back to vegetarians, they do. You know, the ones who are not lacto ovo miss out on conjugated linoleic acid. Are you familiar with that fact? Yes. I was about to ask you as well, actually. Do, do you define that for me? And also, would you define for the listener what you mean by the right kinds of fat? Yeah, so um, I'm of the view that saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, um, they're the best, should be the bulk source of your calories. Not only that, they form structures. I mean, for example, they have other functions in your body. For example, in your lungs, uh, you have a surfactant, which helps uh, prevent bacteria from collecting in the alveoli of your lungs. And that's made out of saturated fat. Now, a lot of people smoke, you know, exposed to lung poll air pollution, what have you. If you're eating a high amount of polyunsaturated fat, say margarine and things like that, you know, I used the example earlier on, of cell membranes being made of bad fats. Yeah. Well, particularly these polyunsaturated fats, and particularly omega-6, uh, and this is where the paleo community, I think, have got it right, is the, the fatty acid consumption, uh, the types of fatty acids. I think we only need to eat in percentage terms of about 1 to 2, 3% of our total caloric intake in the form of omega-3 and omega-6. They're the essential fatty acids. Then saturated fat and monounsaturated fat, and then there's conjugated linoleic acid, um, CLA. That's only found in ruminant um, uh, animals and in dairy and um, so, so if you're not eating dairy, like you said you weren't, then you probably want to be eating some, you know, lamb or um, beef. Okay. Uh, but if you're eating beef liver, you'll get some there as well. But, but that's found in mother's milk as well, human breast milk. Um, so it has an important function. But the other problem with the excessive amount of, um, look, I'm not against molecules, yeah? I'm against, the do, you know, it's a dose-response relationship. You know, the poison is in the dose. So a lot of us are getting, in some parts of America and the UK, people are getting 20% of their calories from omega-6 polyunsaturated fats, particularly in the form of soybean oil, sunflower oil, and things like that. Now, you know, you know margarine in a fridge, it, it doesn't go soft, does it? It doesn't go hard, you know. Um, it has a lower melting point. And if you look at the plants around the world, so further from the equator, the less saturated fats they have, uh, if you go to the Mediterranean, it's more monounsaturated, like, say, olives, things like that. Then further north you go, they become more polyunsaturated. 
because they have a lower um, melting point. And because they have a lower melting point, they also have a lower smoking point where they become oxidized and rancid. And a, a lot of us in our cooking, particularly polyunsaturated fats, some of these fats turn into trans fats. And I think everybody knows that trans fats are bloody deadly. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people are eating trans fats without even being aware of it. It doesn't stay on the packet, but they turn through excessive amount of heating. I'm not even a big fan of overheating saturated fat, which is the most heat stable, because there is a point where you can actually... But fats are oxidized, rancid fat is a bad thing. And if you've been eating sunflower oil or any of these vegetable seed oils that are made in fractionation plants, and things like that, you know, they, that, that's really natural, you know, you know, not to make a naturalistic fallacy, but, you know, uh, th 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 then yeah, I think, you know, you should definitely take steps to uh, collect your uh, lipid consumption. Okay. I have two points that I want to address that um, I don't know the answer to, so these are not challenges. Okay. But they're ones that have been brought up before to me several times, sometimes five times in the same meeting. <laughs> um, one is the China study. Have you come across it? Yes. What do you make of the broad uh, conclusions of that study, which appear to be the mass, um, uh, the, the mass inventory taking of human health in China, where dairy is in nowhere near the level that it is here, and the, com the, the, the apparent uh, correlative effects of heart disease and all the rest of it with the the high in, the intake of high amounts of animal fat versus the more plant based thing. What do you make of it? Yeah, uh, I think it's weak. Um, I think it's univariate analysis they did on it. Um, if you do a multivariate analysis on the data, you get entirely different results. Now, can you? Uh, what it is because the the, so, the, the best um, rebuttal I found, or at least the detailed one, skips itself into statistical jargon immediately and lost. Yeah. I know, but that's the problem. It's uh, the study itself is statistical. Um, so, you know, it's what maths do you run through it. And this is the problem with a lot of nutritional papers uh, and things like this, particularly thanks to the profit motive. But uh, I would recommend people look up a, a, a person called Denise Minger. She was a former raw food vegan, and she, she was just an English student, I think. And she thought oh, I'm going to look at the China study and I'm going to run it through an Excel spreadsheet to find out, um, you know, she wanted to prove that the China study was working. And when she ran it and did the um, uh, uh, different times of uh, um, statistical analysis through it, she actually came out with entirely different results. Uh, but even, even if she did come out with entirely different results, because it's observational, it doesn't prove anything. So, uh, you know, for example, if we look at people who are 100 years of age and above, we know that there are smokers in that population. Yeah? Sure. Um, does that mean smoking is, makes you live to a long age? You know? So, you know, there's a lot... I mean, it, it allows you to infer operational, directional operational hypotheses, but the, the study... But I find it boring, actually, talking about the, the, uh, uh, the China study. I know people have got... But I, I would refer them to these, Denise Minger. I believe her... Um, Website. You do raw food, raw food SOS. That's the one. Yeah. That site I had a problem with. Uh, so maybe I just said because the the posts are phenomenally long, but they should be, of course. Yeah. Uh, we aren't in some business where we we want the answer in five minutes, or we just switch the channel. So okay, yeah. Yeah, raw food SOS dot com. There it is. There's, there's, it's well, actually, that's, that's, her her tone is actually rather good. Um, yeah. Say, look, I actually support in broad in in a broad sense yeah. what what people now call a raw vegan diet or a, a food or plant-based diet. Um, but she says, um, you know, with with all due respect to the doctor who, Colin Campbell, Colin Campbell that's right, um, that, uh, that there are actually some problems and here's what they are. So maybe I'll, I'll review that again. I also need to actually read the China study, so I can't. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, my own scientific biases, I, I, don't, I, I don't really look at meta-analyses or anything like that anymore. I used to in the beginning. Um, my biases are really about mitochondrial health. Uh, I like Terry Walls. I think she does some good stuff. Uh, you know the doctor who was um, suffering from MS? Yes. I know this story through a member of our movement, Peter Jolliffe, his name is, who uh, is, is in, in England at least. He appears to be almost a, a neighbor of mine. He's very close to the north. 
And he is, uh, I think as far as I understand, a gathering from his post and what he sent me, uh, he's suffering from a, a, a degenerative MS condition. He's trying to cure himself from it by using the Terry Walls diet. Right. And that, have you heard how he's doing on that, or is he? he? I need to check in with him. In fact, I'm going yeah. to, as part. I know he's a regular listener too. He's probably the he's probably the only member I know who listens to absolutely every single show as it goes out. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. So, but um, yeah. yeah, I'll ask him because it'd be worth knowing because well, uh, yeah. like, there are certain types of MS that can be impacted with diet. My goodness, this is not. This is something surely that should form part of the series. Yes, uh, entirely. And, 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 you know, this goes back to the other point. You know, you can't go out there and just say, this is the diet for all of humanity, because some people are metabolically broken. Uh, if I eat lots of gluten, sorry, uh, wheat-based products, vegetable oil, and stuff like that, I used to eat that stuff, and I know how I felt. Yeah, So I'm not going back that way, you know. Uh, I don't want to go back to being a, a, a nasty little piece of work, you know. For no good apparent reason, so um, uh, you know. So yeah, uh, find out what your kryptonite is, as uh, I think Dave Asprey says. I, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, uh, that's why I'm having this SMP test done because I, I just want. It's, it's, again, it's, it's not going to tell me for sure certain things, but at least I, I'm taking some of the guesswork out. You know, mm. uh, it's a really good idea, and it, it is something that uh, I came across that. We, as as our genome and our, our evolutionary history, as individual sub, I don't know what to call them now because I don't like referring to it as race anymore. The, the sub ethnicity yeah. we have broken yeah. into, um, they do have propensities either towards or against things like gluten, dairy, alcohol. If you've ever had a drink with a Japanese guy, uh, wait yeah. until, wait until the third drink and see what happens. They turn yes. red, flashed immediately, yes. and this is from centuries. Of, of, of really only sake being the only thing, and, and then only in special occasions. They didn't yeah. get wasted like us peasants in Europe did in the 30s. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, no, it's, it's, that's fascinating. And, and, and also, there's other fascinating stuff. Now, there's another one. It doesn't prove anything, but there's a, a four-point uh, IQ difference between, say, Japanese populations and typical Western populations. I would love to know what the confounding variable there and is. And there, there is. is a hypothesis out there that maybe most of the carbohydrate source in Japan comes from rice, mm -hmm. which is although it's a great, it's a fairly inoffensive one, and um, versus the wheat. And uh, going back to my friend uh, Gavin with the Tourette's, he, while he was doing, uh, starting to do the protocols, dietary strategies are recommended for him. One day he was out and about and he thought, I've been a good boy, I'll have a cheese sandwich. He couldn't drive his car for half an hour. He felt drunk. Now, so, so, you know, if you've got neurological issues, I think taking wheat out is a good move, I think. you know. So depression, things like that. Um, type into PubMed after this show, or anybody, gluten and schizophrenia. Um, just see how many listings we return. And this is not even that commonly known. You know, you hear about cannabis causing people to go crazy and what have you, but what about bloody wheat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, you think how many, how many of us, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, um, you know, Punjabis eat lots of raw cheese and uh, um, you know those kinds of stuff. And I, I remember when I initially went low carb and I was going to see family members and things like that. They say to me, "God, oh, you, you've lost so much weight." And a few of them were doctors, cardiologists, things like that. And uh, I said, "What are you doing?" And I provocatively said, "I eat a high animal fat diet." <laughs> uh, I, I, just to test the reactions, you know, and and the cardiologist in particular, he, he said, oh, saturated fat is bad for the heart, bad for the heart. And I said, well, how come you've got a band of palmitic acid around your heart? Is, uh, is it because it keeps your heart warm on a cold day? What, you know? And um, he didn't have an answer. The other doctors on the table kind of worked it out quite quickly. Um, funnily enough as well, actually, I, uh, I, uh, I'm asthmatic. And, um, and during, in my 20s, my lung capacity on a peak flow meter was somewhere in the 300s, which is pretty low. And since uh, I did these half changes and started supplementing with magnesium and a couple of other things, um, it's gone up to 550. For someone of my size, that puts me in the top 5% in terms of you know being able to push out air in, into a peak flow meter in the population of my size. So, you know, uh, what can I say? Uh, uh, anyway, so my GP said, well, and I've never seen this happen in a guy who's in his 30s. And he goes, you know, we normally see it going down as you get older. And I said, well, you know, perhaps it's 
I uh, explained to him a little bit this that, and the other. And you know, he said, oh, I'll give it a go. This is a doctor in his 50s. Uh, you know, a few stone overweight himself, but a big guy. Uh, and then I saw him about six or eight months later, uh, just for a repeat prescription. And he, he'd lost a fair bit of weight. And he says, you know what? I can't believe how well I can concentrate nowadays. And that's coming from a GP. How many GPs listen to the... No, it doesn't mean I'm clever clogs, but it's how you address this with people. You've got to remember, a lot of GPs in particular in the UK, they're not trained in... Uh, Nutrition really is just an afterthought, you know. Yeah. True, actually, I found this. I found this with a lot of uh, former colleagues of mine or friends of mine that I've, I've spoken to about this stuff. Is that the GPs tend to be amongst the worst educated of the doctors because, for a start, they're generalists, and who the hell can be perfect about anything? I mean, the last universalist in mathematics was Henri Poincaré, and he is over a hundred years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that was the last time that anybody was really in, in charge of the whole thing. Since then, I mean, especially in the medical community, um, it, things have just become so large and complex. And like you say, multivariate as well. It's different yeah. people. It's not even mathematics where one and one is always two, pretty much. Yes. Uh, well, one and one is two. Diff- in this body, it's a different reaction. Or under these circumstances, or after this amount of... Um, after this amount of uh, dietary exercise or this many years of malnutrition or this age, all these things are various. So you have to, yeah, like Asprey says, find your kryptonite, find out what is the problem with you. And, and, yeah, yeah. Are- and, and, and that's what I like, sorry, uh, that's what I like about the Bulletproof Diet as a methodology. I'm not saying, there's other ones, there's a good, another good one, Ben. Have you heard of the Perfect Health Diet? Uh, so it's called the Perfect Health Diet and the, the surname is um, J-A-M-I-N-E-T. Uh, 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 there's some very good stuff on there. Um, also, they're slightly more higher carb, I think, than um, uh, Asprey's version, which is fine, you know, if, if you can handle it, great, you know. Um, but um, uh, and another website, which is one of my favourites, to be honest, of all things on the web, is a blog by a, 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 a veterinary uh, anaesthetist uh, by the name of uh, Petro Dobromolsky, I think his name is. Um, that everyone calls him Peter, and his blog's called Hyperlipid. Have you heard of this website? No, that's new as well. I'll make sure all of these get posted in the show notes. Yeah. I, I would look at that one, because that's quite provocative, but, like, this guy's biochemistry is very, very good, and um, he he goes for a very high animal fat diet, almost 80%. Uh, you know, I, I prefer personally to eat more vegetables and things like that, but, like, um, you know, uh, but, you know, but like, you know, like Asprey says, I, I just see vegetables as vehicles to put fat inside of me. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I, it's one thing that has not been um, rejected by any of the communities is that raw vegetables or very lightly cooked vegetables are good. <laughs> no, one, yeah. no one has yet to refute that. And I think it would be... Um, there are some caveats with that, I think. Um Things containing oxalic acid, you know, like rhubarb leaves, you're not supposed to eat them, they'll kill you. Um, well, okay, I'm talking about the palatable yeah. vegetables, sure. No, I, I, no sure, I, sure, I, sure, but, yeah. Uh, we don't want to be eating um, deadly nightshade either. No, um, no, no, no. But, but, <laughs> but there are things like kale contain oxalic acid as well. And kale being, being, being counted as the new source of calcium, is that a bad thing? Uh, I would... I mean, I eat some kale, but I, I, I make stocks and things like that, so I'm getting calcium from... Um, uh, I'm not too worried. For me, anyway, I'm not worried about calcium intake. I, I would I would say, particularly as you're getting older, magnesium is more of an issue. Right. Um, uh, if you conclude terms, if you think of, like, magnesium as... Uh, sorry, as uh, in your bones, as uh, calcium as the chalk, and magnesium as the glue... And also, you know, if you clench your fist, that requires calcium. And to relax your fist, it requires uh, magnesium. And your heart is doing that kind of movement all of the time. And I think one of the reasons some people, are getting, particularly women, are getting osteoporosis is that they're eating a diet. The fat-soluble vitamins help direct calcium and magnesium to the right places. You know, sometimes people get calcification of the arteries and things like that. Yes, that's because the calcium's not being, uh, not be, yeah, it's not being sequestered properly. Um, yes, and that, that's down to in, in majority uh, incorrect amounts or insufficient amounts of vitamin K2 and K4. Mm-hmm. Vitamin A also has a role to play, and vitamin D. So, uh, and and this is the other thing as well. When eating whole foods, you tend to get the a lot of these nutrients have synergistic effects on one another. So you can try and 
take a supplement in every form to make up the deficiencies in your diet. And yeah, it may have some virtue to it, but I would rather take a lot of the guesswork. And also, 300 grams of liver cost me 64p. You know, so <laughs> I'm saving myself a bucket of load of money anyway. You know, uh, if you're looking for a precursor molecule for any chemical reaction necessary for life in the human body, liver's got it. Interesting. That's a very yes. interesting. The fact that it's a cheap meat as well will yes. uh, in, engage the more impecunious of our members who wish to follow some of these guidelines. So can yeah. I, um, before we wrap up, because we're getting to a, a decent amount of time anyway, yeah. If, if people want to follow the kind of fasting diet that you mentioned before, oh, that's, yeah. I'll into. Can you give a, a brief overview of what you've done in the past or what you do now? Timings, days of the week. Okay. Of, that um, of- first thing, listen to your body. Um, if you if you're coming from a high carb diet and you're the kind of person who eats every three to four hours, you're probably going to struggle doing any extended um, uh, uh, fasting period. Um, so what I would advise is go low carb first, uh, settle into that for a few weeks, and then once you're, I know most people who go low carb notice suddenly, oh my god, I'm not a total slave to hunger anymore, uh, then from that, the longest fast I've done is about five days, um, uh, then you truly know after that, that hunger truly is the best source, um, but um, I now typically do either the sort of bulletproof thing, because the thing with the coffee is, uh, it doesn't raise insulin, so you're getting calories, but one of the major benefits of fasting is a process called cellular autophagy, or some people call it autophagy. And this means, autophagy from the Greek, self-eating. And this is a way that the body... Cat- See, metabolism is made up of anabolism, the building up, and, cat- and catabolism, the breaking down. And it's in the breaking down that the body can do some really clever stuff in terms of breaking down damaged proteins, enzymes, things like this, and burning them for energy or returning the amino acids to the amino acid pool for recycling. So um, uh, so autophagy, I think, is a very powerful... And this is only activated in us after about 16 hours of, of uh, uh, in a fasted state. And how far you want to go into that is... Sorry, well, when you say fasted state, do you mean absolutely nothing apart from... Are we talking... We're, we're clearly, when we talk about five days, we're clearly not talking the same level as Ramadan, right? Where it's not even water. And then you save yourself until the evening. No, water, water is not going to raise your insulin or anything. No, drink water. Oh, and the other one that's overlooked before I forget, salt. Uh, this whole thing, that's the big mistake I made when I was low-carbing. And I think I, you know, hurt my adrenal slightly in the beginning. Was that I wasn't, because I was immediately not eating food in a box anymore with added salt. Yeah. I automatically down-regulated my consumption. So when I started adding salt back in, I felt much stronger. Because at that time, I was doing a lot of physical labor as well. Uh, there was one phase when I was doing some stuff. And I, I noticed I was just fatiguing a, a lot quicker when I was low-carbing. But then that's why I added salt back in that went. How did you do that? Sorry, the salt. Yeah. Or the, uh, uh, well, now I do uh, a bit of salt in the morning when I wake up. Um, your kidneys have to work to change your blood pressure in the morning and they release certain hormones. Uh, one of them is called renin. And um, if the lower your levels of salt intake, the higher your renin. And it's strongly correlated to increased heart attacks, increased levels of renin. Um, very strongly correlated. Uh, of course, that doesn't prove causation. But, um, you know, uh, and I, I notice actually some days if I've had a late night or something, if I have salt in the morning, it kind of reduces some of that fatigue you feel in the morning. So are we talking like, I don't know, a couple of grams on a tablespoon? or? or? Uh, well, um, a, a heat tablespoon is about six grams. Uh, uh, six to ten grams for most people is adequate. Wow. Uh, That's you have, like salt. You really don't normally take salt that way, do you? We don't do it by the Yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, I add probably about a quarter of a teaspoon in water, a pint of water in the morning, and I drink that. Right. Uh, 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 to taste, you know, don't, I'm not saying, like... Check a whole flipping teaspoon on your tongue and uh, puke up shortly afterwards. I know people who've actually done that. That's what I'm saying. Well, it, happens, so, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it actually happens in the Bond film. Um, oh, yeah. cause, I mean, one one thing that I mean the alarm bells are going off already, but I mean one thing we are warned about continuously is a high salt diet. And um, uh, but I do understand what you mean about replacing the right amount of salt if you're lost yes. in through and, dietary changes. Yeah. I think even the American president of the American president of the hypertension society or something like that said that salt this is a load of rubbish. The 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 
Differences in blood pressure attributed to salt intake are within the error margin of a blood pressure test machine. So, yeah, so, but going back to intermittent fasting, there's different protocols, but um, some websites that do good articles, there's one called, which is more an emphasis on bodybuilding, it's called Lean Gains, but he has some interesting articles on fasting. Um, there's another one called, uh, let me just think of the other ones. And uh, did you see The Horizon with Michael Mosley about fasting, Eat Fast, Live Longer? No, unfortunately I didn't. Uh, I need to catch that Check well. that out. Uh, so this, this, what I'm saying is there's different protocols. Um, but essentially you need to be in a faster state for at least 16 hours for autophagy to be switched on. And that's where your cells do house cleaning. Uh, for example, your... Like, say, we all get affected by viruses and bacteria and things like that. And sometimes the fragments of these things are in our cells. And it's only through autophagy that uh, you can uh, sometimes remove these bits out of your cells. So, uh, and also your mitochondria, damaged mitochondria can be recycled and used to uh, things. Uh, fasting also seems to increase uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor as well as exercise, which is very important in brain development and things like that. And sorry, while we're just talking about the brain, because we started off with the brain, and, you know, maybe this is a point, you know, kind of ties in with the vegetarian thing. There are studies showing that long-term vegetarians and vegans seem to have smaller brains than omnivores. <laughs> you know, now, is it, is it that people with smaller brains engage in veganism? No, I think the chain causality is, is that they... There's other things, you see, choline, cholesterol, as you mentioned before, the saturated fatty acids, the essential fatty acids, um, you know, just to make up the raw thing, the, the raw materials for brain structure and function. So I don't particularly want to engage in brain atrophy as I'm getting older. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and this is, in fact, when I first came across the idea of maybe doing a couple of shows on this nutritional point, one of the first arguments I witnessed on Facebook, of all places, was precisely this, whether the vegan diet is, in fact, to quote the person who was writing at the time, eating your brain, or whether you can actually um, absorb, uh, or I think it was even reabsorb, certain fats that uh, are engineered through um, certain vegan diets. I'm going to fight that argument because there were people throwing PubMed IDs at each other about that as well. Yeah. I think that's uh, something maybe I can add into a future show. It sounds when, like. when anybody is engaged in caloric restriction, now whether it's through, say, a vegan diet or through um, low carb or anything like that, let's say you've got excess adipose tissue to atrophy through, you are technically on a high fat animal fat diet. Because at the cellular level, the cells are burnt, you know, in the mitochondria or whatever, but they're accessing the fat in your bum, in your waist or whatever, you know, in your abdominal area. Uh, so, so everybody when they're losing weight is technically on a high fat diet, <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, what happens to that fat? It doesn't get turned into sugar. It gets turned into, you know, it gets turned into, um, through beta oxidation in the mitochondria. Uh, and, you know, so, yeah, uh, this is the thing, uh, uh, the other thing as well is gut bacteria, the, the, the ecosystem in our gut. Everybody's a little bit different. If you encounter, if you take an antibiotics in relatively recent history, it's quite likely you've got dysfunctional gut flora. I, I think uh, that, and that, I, uh, that's a very complicated um, guessing game. And there are other diets like this specific carbohydrate diet, the GAPS diet. Have you heard of that one? I've heard of it, but I've forgotten what it stands for or what it does. Uh, but essentially, it, it, it only picks certain kinds of plants because they prom uh, certain kinds of um, uh, fructo oligosaccharides and things like that. These polymers of fructose that make up soluble fiber and things can feed bacteria that can be problematic to certain individuals. Um, and this is the other thing as well. Certain diseases... Uh, in pathogenic infections, carbs can, as far as sugar, glucose can feed them. So, you know the old saying, feed, uh, is a starve a fever, feed a cold? But sometimes it's vice versa, depending on what pathogenic infection you've got. But uh, sometimes it's good to not eat or, or eat very low carb when you've got certain types of infection. Interesting. I must admit, personally, I haven't. I've had the good fortune not to have to take antibiotics or penicillin or any of the cillins or antibiotics, it must be something like 10 years. It must be. Yeah. 
to. And I, 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 I'm touch wood. I'm very lucky with my with my health. So, but I, I, I tend to avoid all those sort of drugs. The people who take them the, the most tend to be the ones that tell you about their health issues the most. Yes. Yes. I think a lot of weird autoimmune and um, uh, other problems can emerge from after antibiotic taking. It should be public health policy, I think, that once you're given a course of antibiotics, you're given probiotics and prebiotics uh, afterwards. Uh, and this goes back again, Ben, to the agricultural question, because if we're screwing up with the topsoil, we're affecting the microorganisms there. Ultimately, those the microorganisms in us ultimately come from our mother, if you're lucky enough to be breastfed, or from the food you eat, which if it's grown from the soil. You know. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, again, the world of the very small can affect the world of the very large in very weird and wonderful ways. And um, uh, yeah, I think we well, we are only at the beginning of really understanding this. And and actually, if you look at the school of medicine, they they they're now moving the more advanced thinkers to a systems orientated approach anyway they call it they've got different titles for it like uh, integrated medicine you know integrating the various disciplines um, or foundational medicine or you know, some other people could call it holistic so yeah that's, that's so made a jump in the last couple of years yeah and i i think this is one of the things that attracts me to the zeitgeist movement is you know in a in a system theory sense you could say we're subsystems talking about subsystems <laughs> <laughs> That's a fascinating way of putting it, actually, as yes, the human system. In fact, I wanted to I wanted to suggest to you it's interesting that the brain that was generated through, if this um, expensive tissue theory is correct, the brain that was resulted out of behaving with the environment in certain ways now has the propensity to behave towards its environment in certain ways. Possibly. Um, it's hard to say, yeah. That saying we ate ourselves into a state of mind, by the way. <laughs> no, no. But, 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 it's more of a riff on Terence McKenna, who said, isn't it interesting that this, this huge increase in brain size, um, which you know can be explained by evolution, ends up being the very organ that gives birth to the theory of evolution. <laughs> That's true. That is fascinating. And, um, but also, you know, um, evolution has no direction. It, 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 nature isn't. Um, no, nature. I've read things like nature is trying to is beautiful, but it's trying to kill you on every level. I've heard that it just supplies everything to you. But nature is none of those things, or or, or the universe. It just is. Just is, yeah. It, it just, just is. A bunch and, of load of results mingling together. Yeah. And you know, whatever ideal we may have in our minds, if we're trying to superimpose that onto the world and then instill binary choices on um, on. <laughs> which you know, then we're going to end up in trouble very, very fast, and we've been doing enough of that. In, um, I have to agree with you on that. Point. Yeah, you know, so, so you know, look, I emphasise with you know um, vegans and vegetarians about the animal husbandry issue, but um, you know, do you really want a martyr? Uh, not so much the vegetarians, but mainly the vegans. I'm saying, do you really want to martyr yourself on your um, uh, ethical choices? You know, because of your belief systems. Uh, you know. Uh, there's other other ways around it, um, you know. Uh, you know, keep some chickens, give them names, <laughs> raise them, and when they die, you know, take their eggs. Because remember, eggs are just unfertilized. Uh, if they're not fertilized, they're only going to just you know rot. So uh, um, eat them and then look after your chickens, feed them well, and then um, when they die, bury them and you know give them a grave, whatever. But like, you know, you can you don't have. You, you, all we can do is massage the the natural systems. I think we can't we can't correct them. We can't uh, you know control them. All we can do is like massage this you know these these the good aspects so they benefit us. But we we can't really um, go slaughtering loads of animals because we think it's going to cool the planet down or something like that. I think that's or, or not using them. I, I think that's they are, they are biomass themselves. And, uh, you know, they're biochemical machines, as are we. Uh, and they, they sit somewhere in that cycle, you know, the, the circle of life, the, all these things. So uh, they have a role. I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true or not, but I think that there are actually less cattle on the earth than there were in the Middle Ages. I don't know if that is actually true or not. I'd be surprised if that were true, but nevertheless, it'd be, maybe, maybe it's something we should look up. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, again, this was only, I, I was kind of sidetracked, so I, I can't, uh, maybe I shouldn't even brought it up because I can't say anything for his veracity. But, um, yeah. You want to 
interesting statistic, which is it just came out about three months ago. I used to um, I used to work for a company that has a statistics product, <clears throat> and they tweeted uh, that average meat consumption in the U.S. had dropped for 2013, or it might have been 2012, whatever the last whole year was, mm -hmm. statistics, versus prior years. And I immediately wrote to them and said, what about total meat consumption? Yes. That had gone up, which right. is an interesting point, isn't it? So it, it sounds like a hopeful statistic. Per, per capita, it's going down. However... Yes total mass of meat produced and consumed yes. go up. And that's, of course, partially explained by the rise in the, the population. Also, probably in terms of the use of animal products maybe being used in, in yeah. or, or other ways I can't, I can't have them. But um, yeah, you've always uh, got these statistic things that keep coming back and confusing. Yeah. And, sorry, just one other thing, Ben, because I, I actually wrote, wrote some notes that uh, kind of went off track. But um, one thing I, uh, I, I'm you know, looking into epigenetics. And uh, one of the mechanisms is called methylation, uh, and uh, what's that, some of our nutrients are methyl donors. And the methyl donors are things like choline, uh, B12, uh, I think, uh, uh, and other B vitamins. Um, so if you're not getting these foods, what are the epigenetic singles, uh, signals you're sending to your progeny? And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, foods deficient in it are going to result in a... Um, you know, the human equivalent of pandas, but, you know, it's, it's going to have some sort of a uh, an impact in the long run, you know? Yeah, that's certainly one to get into. I think epigenetics is going to have to form part of uh, a future show as well. The, the field of nutrition has got a long, long way to go, but I think it's going to become something that will become a lot more personalized thanks to a lot of these technologies and things we know. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's oh. all I've got to add. Thank you for having me on. Not a problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And that was the interview with Vivac. Many thanks to him again for bringing that to the table. The uh, links to the material he spoke about are copious and numerous, and they will probably appear in the show's description gradually over the coming days as I have time to edit them in. Normally I'm uh, uploading and uh, playing these shows at the last minute um, <laughs> as I travel around. Um, in fact, it is the travel that will mean that next week's show will be um, a quiet one, one that is either going to be a repeat or we'll just leave it blank. Um, we'll just um, not post anything that week. As we gather our forces together for the next few shows. So we hope you enjoyed it. Um, please do feel free to comment, share and um, criticize the episode in positive or negative ways. Um, it is normally the criticism that um, helps me find the next direction uh, or the next topic within the nutrition uh, sort of information landscape. Um, so keep keep it coming. It's very useful. It's much more useful than me randomly clicking through PubMed. So many thanks for listening, and have a wonderful time until we are next on the air here at ZM Global. So I um I was watching TV the other day, and I saw an ad for a product that apparently we've decided as a country we need. I didn't even know it existed. Xenical? Has anybody here heard of this stuff? Well, let me get everybody up to speed here. It is a prescription fat blocker. It's a pill, and you take it, and apparently it prevents fat from being absorbed into your system. And it's prescription, you know, so kids don't start taking it. That their raves, you know, getting all skinny. Dude, you want to come over later and get thin? Yeah, that'd be cool. Dude, I'm so thin right now. Anyway, it sounds like a miracle product, right? Woo! We get another way to lose weight. Uh, except, until you get to the, the last couple seconds of the commercial, where the guy comes on and says, Side effects include the need to have urgent bowel movements. And an inability to control them. Well, then it's not fucking done yet. You need to kick that back to the boys in the lab. Let them noodle on it a little bit more. And then try to sell it to me, say, when it no longer causes the need for urgent bowel movements and an inability to control them. 
Are we that shallow now that that's an acceptable trade-off to lose a couple pounds? My friends, let me remind you all of something. There are worse things than being fat. And being covered in your own feces is chief among them. I will say it loud and I will say it proud. I would rather date a fat chick than a woman who spontaneously shits. And that's not the only such product. We've invented a fat-free chip. You cook them in a lustra. No fat. No fat in the whole bag of chips. You spend billions of dollars to invent a fat-free chip. I don't know what happens to if you don't want to get fat. Don't eat any fucking chips. But now we've done it, and it sounds like a great thing again until, and this time I'm quoting from the New England Journal of Medicine, the shit's been proven to cause anal oil leakage. <laughs> don't react so quickly. Listen to the phrase. Anal oil leakage. My friends, if there are three words you never want to hear used together, may I nominate anal plus oil multiplied by the power of fucking leakage. Market it for your health. Market it for your health.